G'day, folks. Talk to Joshua Gilbert, an agriculturalist. Yarn about himself as an entrepreneur and his personal endeavours in agriculture and how he consults with mob across the board, across the nation, and sustainability, what works with conventional methods or traditional. It's been used over thousands of years. And what works on that land environment, whether it's animals or what you plant in the ground, and his involvement in the housing sector. And as we know, a lot of people are struggling out there when it's got to do with rentals or social housing. Solid yarn. And if you like the podcast, hit that subscribe or follow button. And we've got a Patreon page. The link is within the description. So if you want to roll with the squad and become a patron, that'd be great. I want to thank our sponsors. Permobile Australia the greatest electric wheelchairs in the land. Wouldn't be sitting in anything else but these four wheels right here and they've got great assistive tech also. So righto, let's get into it. Josh Gilbert, thanks for coming on the podcast and wanting to have a yarn with us, mate, and get to express a lot of the views, important ones, especially on the agricultural front. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, bros. So let's just start off with, you know, where's your mob from and where are you speaking from, where you are at on the land today? Yeah, so I'm a war my man, uh, my mob... Uh, are really from around this kind of Gloucester, Stroud region um, and have, you know, been recorded for being here for a long period of time. My um, dad's auntie carries around a book that, you know, shows where our mob were born in caves around the mountains in this place here. So this is home for me. I'm really lucky to live and work on country uh, and, yeah, have the great privilege of, of being surrounded here by my elders, um, obviously around now and, and those who have passed as well who have left this landscape you know pretty perfect and you know what i think is going to continue to be perfect into the future 100 percent. it's a beautiful part of the world up there up near the upper hunter region and just where a lot of it's you'd say i'd say a lot untouched when you got a lot of the natural formations that are up there which is you know awesome compared to you know when you're looking at the concrete jungles and what's going on today and just with the developments across australia and moving in on first nations territory you know but um yeah and then that can get a bit tricky and what goes on there and especially when you've got lands councils involved whether it's state and then you've got national stuff going on and it's all a all a bit of a ring roll but yeah at the end of the day it's good where people can reside on their pieces of land and where they are untouched and you know i'm coming in from dark and jung land and yeah, it is a good spot, but it's um, disheartening just to see some of the developments that are popping up today and just taking away some of those natural wildlife corridors, you know. So, but anyway, so delving into what you do, brother, when it's got to do with, you know, Indigenous First Nations consulting and you're a bit of an entrepreneur, which is great, awesome, and, you know, what you can really part on when it's, you know, teaching another mob out there with what you do. But where did it all start from, like when it's got to do with agriculture? Yeah, um, it, it was really a surprise for me, actually. So I um, I grew up down in the Wiradjuri country, down in a small country town called Burua, um, down in between Young Ass and Cowra. Uh, my mum was a school teacher and got posted down there after she finished uni at Sydney and um, grew up down there and, didn't really think about it at the time, but was really surrounded by, um, you know, obviously Western ag, um, cropping and sheep country. And there's a few memories I, I have from then that, you know, really stick out in my mind. And one particularly is um, I, I had a friend called Josh, um, all the two Joshes in town. And, um, you know, I, I would go out to his place. He lived on a farm and we lived in town. And 
I remember feeding, you know, potty lambs and things like that. And there was something about them that just always connected with me. And I'm not really sure what it was or why, but it, it was an important kind of um, memory for me. Um, I, I then, you know, my, my parents moved. My mom got another job opportunity um, out a little bit further. And my dad actually had a really bad bike accident um, when, when we were out there and ended up with a broken neck and a brain injury. Uh, and I, I literally spent, I, I reckon, about a year in hospital and, um, you know, we, just being with him and my mom going to every appointment from uh, all the way down in Melbourne to all the way back up here on, on country. And, you know, we-, we Yeah, right. Like, so was yeah. that spinal cord injury and a traumatic brain injury too, yeah? Yeah, or... yeah. Yeah, um, right. We spent, we spent ages in hospitals, right? Like I remember being- um, you know, going to a brain injury clinic with him and, uh, you know, he wasn't initially diagnosed or wasn't, you know, they didn't find the break in his neck originally. So um, it was only months later that they discovered that he actually had the broken neck. Um, so it was this kind of really traumatic time, I guess, for my my family. And really, I, I think for me, looking back, showcased my mum's strength. Like, she's amazing. Um, and from that and I can right. relate there. Like, yeah. you know, I've 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 obviously gone through it myself with spinal cord injury, but you know, just the ripple effects of how yeah. that really affects, you know, partners, families, wives, husbands, like the whole and you know, and outside of that, you know, outside of the intermediate family and when it's got friends and everybody else that's involved and work colleagues and you know, it's pretty serious stuff and it can yeah. make and break situations, but yeah, it's um, yeah, it's 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 always sort of hard to hear when it's like talking to other individuals that have gone through it. But then, what it but what it can create, yeah. you know, if that is creating positives, like yeah, it can um galvanize people in a way. Hey, yeah, I think so. And I, I look back now and I I see my mum's strength during that time, and you know I. I wouldn't say I was a perfect child by any means. Um, my sister probably not either, but my mum's ability to, you know, give us opportunities in education and and really push that on us, I think, as kids, while that kind of whole process was happening with my old man. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, that that for me, there's a lot of strength that comes out of that and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of lessons I, I think that I still try and bring into today. But for me, that moment was a, a real turning point for where I wanted to go. So I um, decided I wanted to become a lawyer, actually. And I um, I witnessed my dad being hit from the bike when I was a kid. And he never got justice. He never had the guy who hit him off the bike um, ever apologize or ever, you know, he was never fined or anything for that action. So I grew up with this sense of, needing the right thing to happen that there has to be justice behind all of these actions and i thought for me a law degree was going to be able to do that um so i was lucky i got into university of newcastle law school um did some time there four and a half years and probably my fourth year i had this realization that i i wanted to become a farmer i um i spent a weekend away with some guys um just so um, you're just about to finish and then that's when you yeah yeah i was yeah, right. through. yeah um went away this just this one weekend um and went and looked at sheep properties um up around here and just yeah connected with country and like not not even my country but just connected and and had these reminiscences of being a kid and, you know, that lifestyle growing up. And I saw this sense of community up there that was really powerful for me, like people coming together and, and having a feed and just having a yarn and mm -hmm. just empowering that and thought that's what I want to do. Um, so I, I literally came home from uh, that weekend, made some big life choices, I guess, dropped out of uni, um, yeah, completely changed what I wanted to do and ended up, you know, working and trying to be more involved in agriculture since then. Oh, that's a total flip the script, brother, going <laughs> from, you know, law compared to getting out on the paddock, you know? Like, yeah. But you got to follow where the, you know, where the heart leads and, you know, and then you can sort of see a bigger picture 
that's come out of that and you know and and look what you you're doing now and what you've been in, involved in which is great but yeah and that's that's full on but awesome but so you jumping into this new whole perspective on life and you know you got a taste of what it is to you know farm and agriculture life so what sort of variations and techniques did you sort of jump into because there's so many variations of farming you know if you're looking at if it's just general farming it's you know raising cattle for if it's meat or you know or if it's dairy or if you're looking at you know general vegetables or whatever it may be and there's just so many and then you look at on the on the eighty front and where you know now you're looking coals now and you see you know slabs of kangaroo that you can buy up in there so what what sort of did you what was your path what were you seeking when you got the taste of agricultural and say yeah this is farm and agriculture but i want to learn this and develop these techniques yeah so i um you know so it, it's funny that sheep was the connection for me um and it, it certainly, you know, hasn't been, uh, it was obviously around when I was a kid. Um, it was obviously up, you know, a little bit further up at, around the Armadale region um, that I connected with it again. But back here at home um, on, on country here, my parents were, you know, raising beef cattle and we were showing beef cattle and, you know, it was fun, but it wasn't really like I couldn't see myself doing it um, at that time, kind of before that triggering moment. And my, my grandfather had a dairy farm here as well. So, you know, and my, my grandparents and great grandparents all bred cattle. Um, so, so cattle for me is, is a really interesting parallel. And I think um, it, it's certainly something I, I want to pursue more and more at some stage. Um, but interestingly, I, I've, you know, just had this fascination, I think growing up around sheep and just that connection there. And um my grandmother has a sheep property that she manages by herself um, that she looks after, you know, over, she had over nearly 2000 sheep at one stage running Jeez. them all by itself, you know, mustering paddocks on foot. And um, I, I'm really privileged that I can have had the chance to go down and do shearing with her and do some sheep work with her here and there. And, and there's a, an affinity there. And when I started looking at my family history more, um, mm. I actually found, so so this war in my country was actually the first gifted land to the Australian Agricultural Company. Um, a million acres of war in my country was handed to this public company. Really? Um, yeah, back in, you know, the eight, eight, early 1820s. Um, and they wanted to farm sheep on it. Um, so my dad's connection on this country between our Indigenous and non-Indigenous family here all happened around sheep, like, you know, sheep trespassing, I guess, onto war in my country. So there's this like, you know, and, and sheep don't belong here on this country. It's not great sheep country. Uh, well, we don't have any natural, you know, hooved animals over here. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But even like, even in terms of Western farming, like sheep don't, don't belong here. Um, and so there's this. It tastes really good though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but yeah, so there's this really interesting tie back to sheep. And I, I really think that, um, you know, I, I can see this work at some stage progressing into that industry as much um, as what I want to make sure that we are looking at bush foods as well and thinking about our role in that as mob. Um, mm. So I've done a lot of work with mob around what the bush food industry might look like into the future have spoken mm. um, pretty heavily around that in, in certain spaces. And I think there's some real opportunities there that we need to kind of claim back and, and really showcase this as being our industry as, as mob. 100% brother. That's it. Showcasing it because there's plenty of gear out there that's, that grows naturally that, you know, we've taken advantage of for thousands of years and, you know, not just from the hunter gatherer perspective, but you know, as our agricultural farmers mob, and I'll get to that later. So, and it's funny bringing up sheep because it just brings back a memory where just some of the new techniques that I've seen 
like in the, I will I wouldn't say new they've probably been doing it for a long time but just like with what a lot what they eat how it influences the taste and you know the bio the biology of the animal itself like when because this guy had all this sheep down and it was in like barren country but it was like a lot of salt bush brush that was growing and um you know and the sheep were getting in chewing in on that and just how that flavor just ran through the meat itself mm. and um yeah it just triggered that memory but uh, that's awesome stuff but so on the consulting front right so you know you got you know strong strengths there on consulting and you know and now hearing that where you've had that background in you know law which is very important and i've seen that you know you've got involved in policy work so that's super important but going back on the consultant front so seeing that you've been involved over the years also in housing yeah so because i remember that's the first time i met you years ago <laughs> when it was um down at Barangaroo, just in the PwC building there. And, um, you know, because that's super important too. Like there's so many components to, you know, Indigenous First Nations housing and and how that can be done mm. and what can be done. And, you know, that gets tricky when it's got to do public and private sectors and, yeah. and um, what we can do. But what's your thoughts on... With mob, right? And if you're looking at sustainable outcomes, sustainable future, and if you're looking at public or private housing, and like, how, where do you see it going, right? Like in the future, like now, like you're looking at the current landscape of where we are with the federal government and the certain ministers that are in and with at play. So if we're going to have some sort of sustainable future on on the housing front yeah whether it's public or private where do you see it because and then that's hard too because every state and territory works different but also with mob too right because you can't go building the same sort of structures up in cans yeah. compared to what you might be doing in our springs right so where do you see like sustainability on the housing front yeah, it's an interesting one. I um, I, I see a lot of strength in housing. I mean, obviously, there's, you know, ha housing is so important for more. It gives us a sense of place, a uh, place that's ours. Um, and you know, the ability mm -hmm. to to really, you know, have our own four walls, the ability for us to connect and share. Uh, and it's a place of safety, I think, for me. And and having that space is really important and something. Um, yeah, I always reflect back on and and think about, you know, what that that means oh, and certainly what that meant for me as a kid growing up um you know I, I grew up my as I said my mom was a school teacher after my dad's accident um mm. you know th things changed a fair bit for our family and um you know we, we had to you know my parents had to sell their own home we moved into teacher housing uh, I have friends down the road that would come and basically live with us um because their parents were in town and you know it, it's just mm mob do right and for me um that kind of thinking around housing is really important that connection piece that ability to come together is really important but also having that safety and security around you know what that means for for adults i guess and and for older mob um who are making decisions for families so i um yeah i, I have this real interest in housing i i think it is a huge enabler for mob um and it, it is a huge opportunity for us and, and where we can get young people into buying houses and, and older people too um you know flipping the way in which social housing works so that people can own their own home and if they decide to paint a wall or want to put a hook in for a painting all of that stuff should be fine right um so i'm really proud of the work that we do uh, you know i serve on the board for aho and also iba and I'm really proud of that, the work around first home ownership there um, and really showing that people can do that and, and that's a viable pathway. Mm. Um, but yeah, IBA has been doing that for years, hey, which is yeah, great. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. And, and you know, there, there's heaps of opportunity in this space. There's heaps of people that want housing and we should be supporting as many people as what we can. Um, but you talked about sustainability of housing. I think for me, that's really important as well, that we actually yeah, have the ability for people to make a decision to live where they want to live, whether that's where their mob's from, whether that's where their family or cultural ties are. We need to make sure that mob have that option and the ability to do that. And we also need to make sure that we design our houses in a way that makes sense for us. Um, so I'm really lucky on our AHO board, we have Craig Kerslake, who's an Aboriginal architect. Um, he's a Wiradjuri fella and really, I think, shifts the way that we think about, um, about housing and, and saying, well, how do we have communal spaces so that we can come all together and have a yarn and what's the ability for us to have housing in our way rather than just getting a plan and building it to what it looks like and saying that's enough. Mm. Um, so yeah, he, his voice is always on outside of the code. You got to throw the cultural yeah. stuff in there too. That makes sense to mob, but yes, yeah. it is at the end of the day, it's safe housing. Hey, so. Yeah. So his, his voice is always in the back of my mind and, and probably an experience that's always in the back of my mind and why we need to make sure that mob are consulted around housing is when I was up in, uh, I'm pretty sure it was what air we went to a new subdivision and mm -hmm. they had screens on all the, on all the, you know, the houses around all the windows and people had to have like take them out or, or kick them open so that there was actual air ventilation coming through the house because the houses weren't designed for that, that location. Um, and, and it's just terrible that that kind of stuff happens and that mob weren't consulted around that process because it, it seems like that's a big one. You knocked it on the head there. No code is on. Yeah, right? yeah. That's where, you know, mob aren't involved in, you know, what can work because there's, you know, many great minds across the nation here when it comes to sustainable housing and what they can put across to, you know, state and federal organisations to, you know, have an influence on, yes, it's, you know, cultural, but it's practical too. Yeah. So. Yeah, so where we can bring all that together, that's where I find we get the most benefit. I, I see, um, I, I was just at an AHO board meeting yesterday and seeing some of the work that we do with, you know, building houses for elders in consultation with them to give them their space to build houses for families and to do retrofits for people with disability and all, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. That That's the stuff that, really makes me passionate more passionate about this area and um what i love like I, I cannot speak highly enough of that work and um i know it's not always going to be perfect i, I know there's you know you can't please local... everyone brother doesn't yeah, matter at that you, local... you've got to try your best hey yeah at that local level it might not always work but we can aspire and, and keep working towards that and at the end of the day we just want mob to have access to you know, safe and affordable housing, and that's what we should keep pushing for. Hundred percent, knocked it on the head. It's universal co-design, you know, and having a lot of that cultural flavour in there from wherever the housing's getting, you know, through the, wherever the foundations are getting laid out on the ground. There, it's making sure that all those components are taken in place, and, and how it benefits not just a mob, but you know, when it's got to do with if it's government entities or private or whoever it may be. So it just knows like, you know, we can keep building on that and where it's going to help other Indigenous folks around the country, you know. So it's really having a strong hold on that. So going back to the agriculture, so how, what's the focus and like what's the focus and how does your Aboriginality and the and culture. So what's your focus there when it's having the agriculture, but your pride as, you know, yourself as a primary my man, right? And how does that sort of roll in together and for yourself, but when you're also putting that out to, you know, some of the consultant work when you're getting out to the community? Yeah, I, I think... It, it really stems from that personal story here on War of My Country that my dad's family, that, you know, point of conflict around hooved animals being pushed onto country where mob didn't want them. Mm. And my, it's recorded 
um, quite interestingly because of, you know, it was this big public, you know, organization that got gifted this land and they still exist today. Um, they're still listed on the share market, which is crazy. Um, you know, it's kind yeah, of right. nearly 200 years on um, for them, but, you know, they recorded this conflict because um, they, they knew that the relationship with mob was so important to understanding the, the functionality and understanding this landscape. So they knew that they had to build a relationship. And in fact, the very first correspondence from that agricultural company, when they landed um, just down south here, like near Karua, um, when they landed there, the first oh, yeah. letter that got penned back to England for this company said, we need to have a solid relationship with mob on, you know, you know with indigenous people on these lands because they're the only people that are going to look after us um, and make sure that our company is successful. Um, this is 1825 and, you know, or, you know, they, um, before they talk about sh the sheep that they had landed there, before they talk about the housing that they had to build on that landscape, before they talked about access to water or food, they write in there, we have to have a good relationship with Indigenous people. Um, and that for me is really powerful because what it does... is compared to what, when you're looking at what's happened like yeah. after colonisation, you know, where it's all one-way traffic, right? Yeah. But to hear that... That's a it's a really good thing, you know, when it is gifting back because, you know, you hear a lot of the, obviously the trauma that we carry as Aboriginal people and what's happened to us over the over the years and the intergenerational trauma, you know, it's affected generations. But it's awesome to hear back then that that was gifted back and it's, you know, yourself and other family members that can take advantage of that, yeah. Yeah, well, so they, they kind of make this declaration and then the problem is is that they never follow through with it as well as what you want, right? So, hey. um, yeah, they, <laughs> they they got people who came and guided them upon these lands. They conducted genocide. They didn't pay our mob who were working for them. Mm. Um, my dad's family story is really interesting. They, um, So, you know, after the clash around sheep, um, my my dad's family ended up his indigenous family ended up staying with this white shepherd that was there. Um, she Charlotte Derby nursed him back to good health, and um, they ended up having children. And their their children got sent away to an orphanage so that they could be deemed useful for the company. Like this is the language that they were talking about back. Local or was it like, you know, local orphanage or did they get no, shipped to? Um, Ah, uh, yep. I know the one, those old sandstone yeah. buildings. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, Man, some horrific stuff went down in those, in that place. Hey. Yeah. So, you know, and, and I, um, unknowingly kind of without, you know, knowing that history went there when I was doing some consulting work once and just the shivers ran up my spine, like nothing else. And I, I had to just like stop and Google. Cause I was like, I need to know what happened here. And when I found that family connection, that made a lot of sense to me. Um, but yeah, so so what I try and do is understand agriculture from from that lens. What what does it mean from having this the you know oldest white agricultural company mm. in Australia having gifted, having been gifted a million Warramai, you know, acres treating our people pretty terribly after saying that they should have looked after us. Um, and, and what does that mean for our, us as people and our culture? So I often think when people talk about, you know, mobs involvement in agriculture, or when we say, what does indigenous agriculture mean? We think about bush foods, like we, or, or kangaroo or, you know, hunting for, for different mm -hmm. things which is great. I, I think it provides a good base, but it, it's not the end of the story. Um, we don't think about mob who then, you know, in the 1900s who worked on cattle stations or who worked on sheep stations, those that went and picked cotton, for instance, in Australia as well. Yeah. And they were getting were, paid in rations, in food, yeah. you know, but, no dollars in the back pocket. No, but also had this, you know, made conscious decisions to stay on country 
and, and farm Western products or, you know, be involved in, in cattle farming um, and, and decided to do that because they wanted that connection back to country, that they wanted to stay there and, and keep teaching their youth around what was going on in the country, what that connection was going to be. Mm-hmm. So because of that conscious choice, I, I often think when we talk about Indigenous agriculture, we should be thinking about really broadly um, you know, this, this painting behind me is a, a good example. It's painted by an Aboriginal fella up in NT. And um, there's one of the... They ride in horses or camels or what? Well, yeah, horses. And one of the, um, you know, in the in, in the text that goes with it, he talks about him being one of the horse riders and the connection and what he learned around that. And for me, there's so much richness in that story as well, but we need to think about our involvement in in that kind of farming as well, just as what we should um, as our involvement in native foods. Mm. So we know, uh, I I guess for me that the crux is, and and this is how I try and sell it to to Western agriculture as well, right? We know mob have. And um, that's what I wanted to get to as well, because that's good. You know, it's like taking, having our knowledge. Yeah. And and also, you know, because it's a very so much like when you're looking at the regions of Australia, right? When you're looking at the tropics, coastal dry areas, like sort of where you are, or coastal where I am, and then when you're looking at alpine regions to the bloody desert, like so much. And then it's how's it go when you go tapping into? Because I want to get into where we it's having our knowledge and showing Westerners, right? But how has it been like when it's tapping into all these different regions? Cause you only have certain native things that will grow in certain areas. Right. Yep. So how has it been like touching in with mob, taking in all that information and um, taking advantage of the land in those different areas? Yeah. I think um, the, the bit that I'm always consciously mindful of is the fact that despite colonization, despite, really oppressive government policy our mobs still have legal interests whether that be native title or freehold title or whatever over 60 percent of australia still today um and- hear that people 60 percent native title coming for it yeah so so you yeah, know that, that's quite big right and and it's nowhere near the 100 percent that we deserve but on top of that, we also have a closing the gap commitment that says that we should increase that by another 15%. So three quarters of Australia, um, as we know it now, will have Indigenous interest legal rights over it again. Now, where do you see that though? Like, Because if you're looking at, because obviously a lot of the, this land and whether it's someone that owns residential property or your cattle stations or other commercial entities, right, that loan... Uh, that own vast amounts of land and where it's all first nations land. And then we're talking about 60% and then throwing on a bloody number 15. So how is it like when you're looking at the overlap of that, because if you've got people that own land, it's going to be, you know, hard sell trying to give certain bits up. You know what I mean? Some people are just not going to have a bar of it. So How's all that going to roll out? Or is it just a percentage to what is either owned by state or federal entities? Like, so, you know what I mean? Is it, yeah. is it government land or is it overlapping well, what with private as well? Yeah, it, it's mob held land, you know, whether that be, you know, New South Wales Land Council ownership or ABC rights or or other interests and and by no means they're not perfect right like they don't give that exclusive freedom of us deciding exactly what we want to do over that 60 percent and and certainly there's work to be done there but what it does mean to me is that if we've got rights um and kind of have, have had to fight for rights over that much of Australia's land mass we know that agriculture sits across about 54% of Australia's land and mm. it doesn't take an expert to realise that there has to be crossover and that there will continue to be a large amount of crossover because of climate change between those two industries. Uh, between, that is true. 
um, our mob's ownership and and agricultural ownership or, or agricultural production. So where that crossover is, what I hope we can start having a conversation about is ensuring that mob get benefits from that, whether that be employment rights, the ability to farm themselves, um, you know, being self-determined and saying we want to farm cattle or native foods or whatever on our own lands, um, that we, we have the ability to, to, you know, really work in with white pastures where we make that choice or whether there's training opportunities for mob, all of that kind of work has to be done and we're a long way from that. Um, so I'm always really mindful of the fact that we have a lot of work to do there. And that's the stuff I try and tell agriculture about all the time, because I just say there is a massive gap here. And until we start addressing it, we're a long way off forging good, solid relationships around this. Yeah, that's it. And, you know, having solid strategies for, you know, closing the gap, but where do you see it when it's, when you're knocking on the door of either state or federal parliament, like, are, are they listening or what? Yeah, I, I think we're getting some traction. I think um, ag- agriculture has been really slow to take this up, right? Because they're, you know, agriculture, Western agriculture is a colonizing act. The process yeah. of taking over land, you know, murdering mob, um, doing yeah. all kinds of horrific stuff to our, our, our mob, actually. And then, you know, carving trees and and plowing out grounds and saying well this is now ours Mm. that's how australian agriculture was formed that that, that's the real history around it's taking over the land and just terraforming it you know and just throwing on animals that you know where it's not where it's just compounded the land and you know because we don't like i said before there's no native hooved animals and where they can really tear up the land like yeah you can contain it and manage it but you know, it's, it's, it is hard. Like you're seeing that where it has happened over years and still does. And like, it's even full on lot where you see it happening in other countries like Brazil, where at an alarming rate, where some of these, you know, where it's just moving in on the rainforest and even, you know, where it's pushing some of the, where you still got people that like indigenous folk over there that are still living in the Amazon and it's pushing them out losing their culture like this stuff is still happening you know and it's still happening in australia but the thing is it's like yeah like where it's pointing to where taking advantage of our land growing growing what has always grown here for thousands of years and where it's not having devastating outcomes like you know it's it's stuff that is used to the land and you keep pushing and utilizing that so and that's where, you know, I want to touch base with you on that too, what it's got to do with Bruce Pascal, you know, because I found that pretty powerful man when I read his book and the amount of flack that that brother got, like from just a lot of people on the wrong side of the fence. But we've been, you know, Aboriginals, Torres Strait Islanders, First Nation mob, like we've been agriculturalist farmers for thousands of years, not just hunters and gatherers. And I shouldn't say just, but, you know, it's everything involved there when it's got to do with agriculture, hunting, hunters and gatherers. You know, we've been baking bread years before the bloody Egyptians, before Tutankhamun was sitting on his pyramid chewing on bread, you know what I mean? So it's, it's so important that, we keep on stripping back the knowledge in the land of, you know, who we are and holding on to that knowledge, but enhancing it now. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for me, you know, uh, the, the resources and the, the, the sources of information that, um, you know, Dark Emu covers that some of the, you know, Bill Gemmage and some of those other kind of agricultural writers around what the early settlers, you know, the white settlers saw when they came up through these lands. Um, you know, it, it really tells that story of land being pristine, right? Like it was recognizable that there was activity happening beyond, you know, just being a massive forest, really. And 
um, I, I was doing some work here on our country yesterday, um, to, you know, trying to write about what, what this land was like here in, in the, where the township of Gloucester is. And the early, the earliest recording of, you know, this kind of journal art, journaling around what they saw when they came here talks about um, how incredible this land was with emus and kangaroos and fish. And I, I've never seen an emu on this, on this place. I, I don't think uh, there would have ah. been here for ages. Right. But, but that's what they were recording. That there was emus roaming here in massive numbers. Um, they're talking about, um, the mountain ranges that sit right around this place um, as being this kind of ode to, to you know, Western, what they could remember of England with the the big mountain ranges being like castles that were falling down. And for me, if there's that reference after there being, you know, agriculture in a white sense in England for however many years before they came here, mm. and it was recognisable that that activity or, or an activity like that, was taking place on these lands that for me is the trigger point right that that there was actual active activity that was protecting and maintaining and preserving this landscape for it to be in such as perfect position um almost recognizable to be similar to england which um isn't a great reference but at least it provides yeah. that kind of um you know that the, there is something recognizable in what was happening here yes what was happening there yeah, that's awesome. So, you know, preservation, conservation. Yeah. So, how like with what you've learned, but just looking at a lot of mob across the the land of what you know, where you do see some First Nations people take advantage of their land and and farming, certain if it's you know animals or what's growing out of the ground. But so, where do you see? Where do you see mob where it's having that knowledge and where it's pushing that over to Westerners and whether it, that's, you know, buy and sell and trade and whatever it may be. So whether it's, that's to within Australia or outside, because I see where there's certain bush foods that, yeah, they've taken off here, but you're seeing a lot of interest from overseas as well. Yeah. So I, um, I think for me, the the biggest opportunity in agriculture and particularly for mob is around gastronomy, the story of food, that where we have that connection of place and where we can talk about our connection here and mm-hmm. then how we farm on this land um, it is really quite fascinating. And we should be selling, almost selling the story as much as what we should be selling the product, right? Yeah. Um, but, but there has to be some kind of parallel there. And it's basically what happens in the US. They actually trademark their agricultural products so that the story behind it gives them a premium price for their, what they're farming. Yeah, because I've seen that happen in, like, um, yeah, it's good, but also where you've seen these major organisations in the States and, you know, where they got, you know, the GMOs, right? and where it might be some sort of wheat or whatever it is and where they own so much land and somehow that's it's picked up in the wind landed on some old timers land starts growing there i don't know all the legal stuff behind this right but then it starts growing right that type of wheat and they can prove it so then they have ownership over that bloody stuff that starts that's blown through the wind, landed on that land on some old mate that's been there for three generations or whatever, and then they claim it. How does that bloody happen? Yeah, yeah. I, we, well, we've had a similar story in Australia, not not to the extent of ownership, but where a a person's organic crop was um, had overspray of chemical residue from the next door oh. neighbours um, go across their their farm and whether there was, you know, damages that had to be awarded because of that overspray. Um, yeah, so, so it's a real thing, I, I think. Um, and we, we do need to make sure that we have that, have protections in place for mob that are farming. Um, you know, we need to make sure that our rights are really looked at differently, I guess, to, to everyone else's. Um, but at the moment, we don't have that. So we actually so have an IP and stuff, yeah? 
Well, even just our own ability to make our decisions around what we want investigated and what that's going to look like. So at the moment, we don't have any idea about how many Aboriginal people are farming in Australia. We have no idea. We know that there's less than five Indigenous ag graduates across universities in Australia every year. Um, wow. And people, I, I just want to be clear because people always say, oh, 5%, that's great. No, just like five people, um, you know. So the, there's a huge kind of gap there around our involvement in, in agriculture at large and, and getting qualifications around that. Um, and we don't have a... And you're a, doing advocacy around that too, yeah? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, but we also don't have an advocacy body um, that tries to advance our rights in agriculture either. Ah. So we, we don't have a farming, a, an Indigenous farmers group or, you know, in, in America they have Indian, the uh, Indian Ag Council, which is a massive organisation that um, brings together a pe- you know, mob from all over the US to share their, their produce and certifies them as being Indian grown. We don't have that here. Brother, you got to start, you know, apart from your busy schedule, you got to be ch- chairing something. I'll, I bet there's a whole lot of more that would jump on board some sort of body to formulate. And if you're seeing a working formula, that's, you know, because they've got the same, same, but different when you're looking at if it's the American Indians, you know, Canadian Aboriginals or a lot of Indigenous mobs, right, across um the world but you know if that's working there and you can see a model and they got the data and research and we can bring it over here because you know we've got a lot to give so yeah, yeah. any plans of starting one up or what <laughs> well <laughs> um well through my research I'm, a, I'm actually writing about this at the moment so trying to say we actually need a body um that why it makes no sense that we have so much indigenous land interest and, and legal right ownership um by mob that we don't have an indigenous group that really focuses on indigenous agriculture at large mm. um, i mean we've we've certainly got you know the first nations bush foods and botanicals group and mm. there's mob who are doing you know native grains work which is great but there's no kind of national consolidated voice around that that also includes mob that the farming beef cattle or you know, um, cropping or, or anything like that. So for me, that's where the opportunity lies. But the good thing, I guess, about being public uh, and talking about this is that I get mob who message me and say, um, you know, we're Indigenous farmers, like follow our business on Instagram or, or Facebook and see what awesome. we're doing. And, and for me, that's inspiring. So I've got some fellows that contacted me recently. They just got like the top price cow, um, for their breed not long ago. Their, their cattle are incredible. They're doing such a good job. And and that's what really like speaks to me. That's the that's the why. Like that's the reason why I'm doing the work I'm doing, why I'm researching this and trying to make a bit of noise because we know Mob are doing it really well. And um we should be celebrating that, you know, and, and really shouting their praises and that story of food, that connection around huge. You know, it's massive. Mm. That's awesome. So listen up, mob. So if you're interested, there's I know there's more than enough people out there that especially when it's got to do with food, like because you know, it that's where it leads to, right? So whether it's got, you know, four or two legs, or if it's something sprouting out of the ground, it ends up on your table. So and there's a huge economy around that. So, you know, it'd be great for us to harness that with like, yeah, you got the people that are physically doing it, but if it's yourself and others that can, if it's building some sort of, you know, not-for-profit or non-government organisation that can really get behind and just keep elevating, you know, broadcasting that voice because, you know, there's many out there and with the power of social media or whatever it may be to really push that out there, so especially to take advantage of that now, I think now would be a good time. Like, you know, with the current government and where you could really get the push on, but, you know, just see what happens. But, um, yeah, that's what it's all about, brother. Hey, just make noise, make yeah. noise and they will come. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, but where do you, so when it's, so, 
when it's got to do with so you can see this is this sustainability when it's got to do with what mob are trying to do on the agricultural front and where it can build like when it's looking at also like a business front obviously but where it can distribute and i want to go back to so where do you think we can help like the western side where do you think our knowledge can help them you know yeah. so so our, our knowledge has been helping westerners on this country since they landed here right um we we pointed them to sources of food when they started trying to find water for their cattle, we showed them where it would be. We showed them where the best grasses would be for their cattle. Um, we showed them sites that were important to us so that we could try and preserve them. We showed them and taught them our language. Um, so that, that there is some literature out there that talks about this, um, what's termed as coexistence, um, which is kind of, an interesting way of framing it but really i guess what it points to is that you know we, we work side by side mm. and, and then the flip side of that is that we also kind of took on western concepts to advance our own rights and our own thinking so we talked um and there's literature out there of you know initiation for men that went through an agricultural system where you would start off at as being a stock boy, um, you know, kind of in the sheds and looking after mm. horses or whatever and moving all the way up to being a head stockman. And that was your like rites of passage. And because you could go out with elders and they teach you about agricultural, uh, sorry, about cultural sites while doing agricultural activity, um, that kind of crossover is really fascinating. Um, so we don't really talk about that, but that, that was happening every day, you know, kind of as colonization was happening on these lands. Um, so it certainly happens. I think mob have a lot more knowledge that um, certainly hasn't been tapped into. And, and certainly, you know, I think our knowledge around country is so critical to the success of Australia as a country, not right. only for agriculture, but for because of climate change. We know mob's knowledge around climate change and its impacts is, you know, the, the only and longest set of information that exists around this. And for me, there's real opportunity to to share that, but only in a way that's, you know, suitable for us to share that, that it shouldn't be just a, well, you've got to come and share it. It needs mm. to be done in the right way. So I, I think there's huge opportunities there, but it does just need to be tailored and it does need to be self-determined that mob want to share that information in a way that mm. makes sense to them. And what are you seeing on the climate change front? Like when it's... What, like when it's looking at mob across the nation so and just where some of the voices are, you know, spread and what are they saying and what do they want us to do here when it's like not just looking up after our people but and our own interests, but, you know, we've got all sorts of different cultures that are residing now on this continent as a whole. So what are a lot of these voices saying? Yeah, so I think... Um... Unfortunately, because of the of what drives climate change, a lot of mob's work has to have been around advocating against, you know, mining or, or gas projects and things like that. Um, mm. that destruction of land that happens through it. So I think that there has been a lot of focus of mob around, you know, really localized activities of that. Um, I, I think you know certainly groups like Seed Mob um, have been really great in getting young youth um, together to have a yarn about climate change and its impacts. We know Mob are more susceptible to climate change as well, mm -hmm. um, and that we're going to start losing you know pretty significant cultural assets or you know and I don't mean assets in a you know financial way, but assets is what's important to us. Yeah, um, 100%. You know, we're, yeah. we're going to start losing some of those sites and we need to be really cautious around that and how we protect them or or how we preserve them and what choices need to be made there. Mm. But for me, the knowledge that Mob has around climate change is just fascinating. Like it's 10, 12, 13,000 years old. Um, yeah. You know, we, we sit on the, the side of the beach and can tell yarns of when the ocean was a lot further away than what it is oh. now. 
you know, yeah, that, that's what I was going to touch into there. Like where I was listening to some um, mob that like were way up north, and uh, you know, past sort of in between sort of Brisbane and Cairns sort of thing, and just where their songlines are, are talking about where where the barrier reef was, where that was land once upon a time, and over time, over generations, over thousands of years. Their songs and song lines have talked about where the water started receding mm. you know, and it started exposing the Great Barrier Reef of what it is today. Well, that's just, that's wild. They've seen that in real time over generations, you know, true yeah. to form. Yeah. And, and that's the, the stuff that um, our, our science our scientists haven't engaged with right like it 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 often appears to me and, and it also happens in climate science which is a, a, a huge kind of disappointment for me but it, it's almost like we need science to you know agree with what mob have been trying to tell scientists like mm. we, scientists do surveys and, and do you know experiments to confirm that what mob are telling them is the truth and mobs on the opposite side of that saying, well, we told you and we've been telling you for ages and you just won't listen to us. Mm -hmm. And now that you've done your experiment and you reckon you, you agree with us, which could have saved you all this money and you could have just paid us and, you know, or, you know, acknowledge what we're doing and we could have just moved on. Um, so for me, that, that there's a real gap around that. And particularly in, in terms of climate change where you've got that, you know, real longstanding information and data and that those stories that connect with land that for me is um, that kind of opportunity to showcase that and for climate scientists to sit down and listen to us so that we, our stories can be shared around that. Yeah, spot on. So gastronomy, can you just explain that to people and the mob yeah. out there of what that is and, and, just, and, and what you do within that? Yeah, so gastronomy is the story of food. That, that's kind of it in that simpler sense. Um, it, it really is the, the way in which food is made, the, the connection that we have as mob to, to land and what the longstanding history around that is, how food's produced and the, the kind of relationship that we have with food. And I think, you know, it, it's not a, probably a foreign concept to mob. Um, you know, we, we know and respect food and um, respect animals in a, a really different way to, to what Western society um, has been raised to do that so um yeah it, it really is that that showcase but the way in which we do it is really important and the way in which um that all comes together is quite powerful as well so my role in that is really just you know we we share our food story our climate change story our mob story uh, on our country on our farm we share what we're doing uh mm -hmm. But really, it's building, I think, the ability for us to really come together around that and celebrate food rather than just being really simply transactional, making it more of a celebratory thing. Yeah, true. And there's so much to take advantage of, you know, yeah. whether it's on, you know, the land, sea. Yeah. You no, know, so much. And that's it. Yeah, it's farming on farming on land, but hey, farming in rivers and sea and the sea as well, like taking advantage of that. You know, there's a lot out there, you know, but yeah. is there anything that you want to express other on the podcast that should be broadcast, should be heard that we haven't touched base on? Uh, I, I'll just say, um, Obviously, I, I want Mob to be farming if that's an interest. Um, there, there are opportunities out there now. Um, there's scholarships at CSU, for instance, where I study for Mob to go and study agriculture. And it, it really is, we, we are kind of trying to get there so that if, if there is that interest that Mob can go and do that. I think um, I, I really, like, I always encourage Mob and, and anyone really to, to follow passion. Um, I think my story, you know, at the start kind of showcases that, that, you know, even if the choice is a bit drastic, just follow what, where that passion lies. And if, if there are mob that are interested in agriculture, hit me up. I can share the links to the scholarships and introduce you to the team down there. They're really good. Um, and I've had the real privilege of learning from some of that mob down there. 
Um, and, and I think the other thing um, that I just wanted to cover is a big thank you to you, bros, like your work and your advocacy work and, you know, you've been around the chats for a long time and, and telling our stories is, is really powerful, telling your story to try and get people to speak out and share and showcase what, what you do and, you know, to show that mob with disability belong in every sector um, just as much and should be striving and, you know, being encouraged in there um, is really important to me, um, obviously with my family story, but I, I've seen your success and seen our mob success in that um, disability network and just want to really thank you for that work. Appreciate that, brother. That does mean a lot, hey, you know, and you knocked it on the head too. So where it's, you know, getting mob and people with disability you know it's getting in all sectors it's closing the gaps on all facets of life hey so because yeah. we've been through a lot as people and you know and and you know and you've gone through a lot and you know and where that's galvanized your family like when you're talking about your dad and what's happened there and you know and where that can shape life but you're doing solid work brother and i hope off the back of your busy schedule there is some sort of formation of some sort of body that can really add to, you know, building cultural wealth and gastronomy and agriculture and all everything that we've talked about. Super important, you know, you know, take advantage of that before, before it's lost. Well, let's jump, jump on and have a go, you know? So if people want to get in contact with you, so whether it's social media, email, whatever it may be, throw that out in the atmosphere, brother. Yeah. So I, um, and, and like, I, I genuinely make this, um, this, this claim, like I will get back to anyone and I, I'll always be up for a yarn and I'll always have a chat to anyone that, that comes through. Um, I, I poke corporates a, a bit, but, you know, make sure that they recognize that the, the contribution we're having, but for individuals that just want to yarn and, you know, um, or, or have a chat or, or share or learn, uh, always happy to have a yarn. Um, just Google Joshua Gilbert. Um, all my social media is under Gilbert Joshua and M at the end. Um, so yeah, just hit me up anywhere. Or as I said, always free to have a yarn. Like, you know, I've got kids from year 10 who are contacting me about their um, school assignments and stuff like that at the moment. I love it. Um, and, That's and awesome. Always- yeah, and I always get back to people. I always love that connection. So um, I really mean if, if anyone wants to have a yarn about any of that, any housing stuff, whatever, sing out. You heard the man, you heard the brother, Joshua Gilbert, proud of my man. Thanks for coming on board and having a yarn and just expressing all things on agriculture from First Nations front, super important. Like I said, I hope there's... And I do see a lot of future, you know, promises that are going to come forward. And, you know, they've got, you know, good, strong Aboriginal men like yourself that are going to really, you know, open the doors and and just keep forging forward. So thanks for coming on and having a yarn. Appreciate it. No, thanks so much for having me, Bryce. And, uh, yeah, I really appreciate the work that you do. So thank you. Awesome. Cheers, brother. Thanks, Bryce. Good yarn, eh? interesting to see what can transpire with Josh and others and helping mob harnessing the land that they live on whether animals or what's growing out of the ground creating agricultural income setting that up passing that knowledge on to the next generation creating legacy structures a lot of land out there that mob can take advantage of and do it their own way solid and if you like the podcast hit that subscribe follow button and we're also got a patreon page the link is within the description so if you want to roll with the squad and become a patron that'd be great and if you want to get in contact with me you can get me via instagram at street roll and cheetah or email one word street roll and cheetah at gmail.com and we've also got a facebook page keep rolling with jake briggs so check it out and i want to thank our sponsors permaville australia 
of the greatest electric wheelchairs in the land. Wouldn't be sitting in anything else but these four wheels right here. And they've got great assistive tech also. So righto, we'll see you on the next one.